Hello, and welcome. We Hello. Have our series of presentations on hydroacoustics. I am Georgios Haralabus, and together with my colleagues and co conveners Mario Zampoli and Peter Nielsen, we would like to welcome our two speakers, Dr. Fernando Lebra and Professor John Orko. The first presentation is by Ronan, and it's on advancements in hydroacoustic signal processing at CTBT, international data center during the past two decades and plans in the future. This presentation discusses advances in oceanographic and hydroacoustic physics-based models, data processing algorithms, and high-performance computing facilities that provide opportunities to reduce uncertainties in monitoring and verification of possible nuclear explosions in the ocean. The speaker, Dr. Ronan Lebra, after starting a career developing imaging algorithms and software for exploration geophysics, he has been involved for 27 years in data processing for nuclear monitoring. He became particularly interested in hydroacoustic propagation and the complementary nature of seismic and hydroacoustic waves when developing the tools that process both together at the IDC. I am pleased to invite uh, Renan to give this presentation. The stage is yours. I'm sharing my presentation. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Georgios. And uh, I just want to start by uh, acknowledging the uh, my co-authors. Uh, and actually, uh, Peter Nielsen has been uh, quite uh, instrumental in, in putting together his material, uh, as well as uh, uh, Eric Mial, uh, Noriyuki Kushida, Paulina Pittner, and Martin Kalinowski. So this is about the advancement in hydroacoustic signal processing at CDBT IDC during the, the past two decades. and and some plans for the future. So uh, this is the outline of, of the talk. Uh, and uh, we'll start with a brief introduction of uh, the origin of what became the CTBT IDC, thematic processing algorithm, uh, talking about the uh, scientific expert and uh, prototype IDC. And then we'll highlight, and that's going to be the main part really of the talk, we'll highlight the advancements of the automatic hydroacoustic data processing for the, the past 25 years that it's been used uh, at the IDC. And we'll conclude with a few remarks on uh, potential for future hydroacoustic data processing capabilities for the near and long term development. So um, the, the adventure of uh, the uh, CTBT started uh, a long time ago, pre previous to the availability of the treaty for signature in 1996. Um, and uh, it really started in, in, uh, in the 80s and 90s. And the uh, group of scientific experts, uh, Ola Dalman was a, a principal member um, made several proposals for experiments, and they were called GSET 1 to GSET 3. Um, the GSET 3 was the, the most uh, significant, and it included the uh, acquisition, a rapid acquisition of data, processing of data from a global network of seismic sensors that were contributed by several nations. Um, it would then provide uh, as much as automation as possible in the collection, processing, and distribution of data, and establish a monitoring system architecture flexible enough to allow technical modification and improvement as they uh, be needed. Um, the GSET 3 was mostly limited to seismic monitoring, and uh, Towards the end of the period of GCET3, which started in 1995, uh, 
um, until uh, 2000, it started to incorporate a few hydroacoustic stations that were donated by, uh, that were contributed by the United States. So um, that was the early days. So uh, there was a prototype running at the uh, Center for Monitoring Research, uh, 95 and 2000. And then uh, after the CTBTO was established in 1997, uh, the United States generously donated the software and associated documentation of the software to the PTS. And the first delivery of the software was, uh, it was called R1, release one, uh, was around, uh, around 2000. The um, IMS hydroacoustic network was uh, routinely monitored during the R1 release, and it was a very limited network. There were two hydrophones uh, that were contributed at uh, Wake Island in the middle of the Pacific. They were located about 240 kilometers apart, so it is not the uh, model that we have currently with the triplets of, of hydrophones and the in-water uh, hydroacoustic station. And another a station that was used to um, test out the uh, T phase uh, station was at uh, VIB at Queens Island, Canada, with one vertical component. So that was quite limited. Um, and the, uh, the, the main uh, components of that uh, software, uh, which really is still, these are still the main components, are the uh, DFX software detection and feature extraction. This is a software that does the uh, automatic detection on, on the um, data flowing in to the IDC, station processing that does uh, limited interpretation of the type of phases that uh, are detected by DFX, and then the global association, uh, which uh, puts together detections from several stations and produces a, an, an automatic bulletin. So it's a uh, since the beginning of the system was mostly seismic, was a seismic bulletin, and the uh, hydroacoustic stations were contributing to that bulletin as well. Um, the R1 release was operational uh, from the 15th of May 98 to uh, 99, and a later version was running at PIDC in Arlington, USA. The, then came the release two in May 1999. And uh, finally, the release three was more complex and, and is near, was nearly what we are currently running. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, what the additions have been since then. Um, and that release three included the auxiliary stations. Uh, the auxiliary stations, they are seismic auxiliary stations, and they are uh, in uh, <clears throat> comparison to the uh, primary stations, which are received uh, continuously, These uh, the data from those stations are received received on request based on automatic events that were produced by, <clears throat> uh, by the system. Um, so release three was installed uh, and uh, then an ad hoc expert group uh, on the evaluation of hydroacoustic data processing at the IDC was uh, constituted and uh, there were a number of meetings and uh, this group came up with uh, six uh, high priority areas, uh, which is listed here, uh, the station-specific processing parameters. It should be implemented, so the, the, the processing parameters should be station-specific. Uh, there was a recommendation to uh, go to multi-channel processing of trial data, and I will go over exactly what's happening now and why uh, uh, they were recommending that. Uh, as opposition to, in opposition to what is currently going on. Um, and then uh, they recommended the usage of T and H phases uh, in event definition and rotation, as well as improvement in modeling of travel time and transmission loss, uh, better characterization of arrival time. In other words, a refinement of uh, what is in place now, which is a probability weighted travel time, time picking rather. And then uh, they recommended a spectrogram tool for interactive phase identification. This is the uh, network, uh, the hydroacoustic network, the IMS. 
and um, this is actually the most complete of the of all the networks of the IMS. Uh, all of the stations have now be certifi been certified. Uh, they were deployed during the period 2001 to uh, 2000. I think you said 2017 here, um, and with a gradual increase in the number of sensors providing data. And uh, all hydroacoustic stations um, are contributing data to, to the IDC. Very quickly, you, many of you probably have seen this uh, picture before. And what this is showing uh, is the overall uh, data processing system at the IDC. So starting with the uh, four technologies, uh, seismic, uh, hydroacoustic infrasound, and, and radionuclide. So the raw data comes in, uh, what we call the pipeline. Um, there is some um, on the SHI side, I'm not going to talk about the radionuclide here. On the SHI side, so seismic hydro infrasound side, we have uh, detections. This is what the silos are showing here. And uh, the uh, first automatic bulletin is produced one hour after real time. Um, this is already including uh, hydroacoustic data. So the hydro contribution is really right from the beginning in terms of the, of the automatic standard list, of the automatic bulletins, if you will. And, uh, and it's carried through all the way to the cell phone. Now, of course, uh, if uh, a hydroacoustic station is far away from the source and there is a clear propagation to it, uh, it might not be seen in cell one, but it will be but later on in cell two and cell three. By the time of cell three, it will have time to make it to uh, its way. Um, and then uh, an important part, of course, is the uh, fact that the cell three, which is six hours after real time, is reviewed by the analyst and reviewed event bulletin is what constitutes the product of, of the IDC. Okay, so uh, I will go in more detail. I won't go into the, the specific of the uh, processing module. This is for the next slide. And uh, yeah, so, um, This is showing the processing flow at the top for the triplets of hydrophones and uh, at the bottom for the T stations. And they are quite similar. Uh, we received the raw data. The DFX uh, does some uh, detection processing. And then uh, StayPro does the uh, grouping of arrival and attempts identification in terms of the different phase types, uh, either H, T, or N, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, the uh, hydrophone processing has one more element, which uh, groups detections at uh, single hydrophones together. Uh, that is called the HAZA, uh, hydroacoustic azimuth estimator. Um, I'm sorry, hydroacoustic azimuth and, um, and slowness estimator. That's what the S is for. And so uh, that was upgraded, actually. The initial uh, release uh, from, uh, from the United States, uh, what's called HAE, and uh, did not include the computation of, of slowness. So that, that has been upgraded. And uh, the um, alternative to that might be uh, something that's currently running on the dev land, which is the uh, multi-channel cross-correlation algorithm, progressive multi-channel cross-correlation algorithm, PMCC. So um, that's uh, the grouping of the detections. Uh, and then we go into the uh, network processing, uh, which is currently done in operations by the Global Association, which was delivered at the time of the uh, PIDC initial release and the R3 release. Um, and we have an alternative now, uh, which is NetVisa, which is also running in parallel to GA and uh, the results of which are started, uh, the, the analysts have started to use since uh, 2018 now. OK, 
in and uh, finally uh, event uh, localization, which is actually a, a part of a global association. So the, the main difference uh, between uh, the uh, triplet and the uh, T station is that we have this uh, grouping together of the three hydrophone uh, data. Right, so um, one very important enhancement that has been done uh, by uh, Frank Reber uh, in 2006 uh, was uh, that he recomputed the uh, travel time and transition loss. So if you remember the recommendations that were made, uh, one of them was to have station-specific uh, parameters, and this is definitely a very important station-specific parameter to uh, compute travel time and transmission loss to one particular station. And the other uh, very important contribution from Frank Graeber was the, um, the fact that he had basically had to reverse engineer live hydro to we need to have a source of the software. And so he basically we re redid a lot of the software engineering uh, related to um, the calculation of multiple time metrics, the capstrol analysis, uh, he en enhanced and enlarged the frequency processing bands. Uh, so a lot of work really into that. Um, later on, uh, Mark Pryor, 2008 from 2011, and uh, Kumar uh, did some, uh, some work uh, on uh, phase identification. So they enhanced the phase identification uh, part of the processing. That's, if you remember, uh, called the STAPRO. Um, and um, later on, uh, we, we have uh, enhancement also, uh, which is now more recent, uh, which is the uh, to put in place uh, in, in a testing mode of the uh, PMCC, the multi-channel processing. Um, so that was also one of the one of the recommendations that was was made by the by the experts. Um, by the way, I probably it's a good time to let you know that um, this I may not go into very much detail into each of these slides. There are quite a few of them, uh, but included in the presentation, which you can download, uh, is a very large list of uh, references. So if you want to go deeper into of those references that are mentioned here, this is um, I'll try to summarize and, and go over and give you an impression of the, the amount of work that was that was done. And one of the enhancements that was done is an enhancement to the hydroacoustic rule base, so uh, of the, the identification of, of phases. Um, and, and the enhancement is, is in the uh, red square here, uh, is that there is a, a free uh, selection of, uh, uh, of of H phases, so that it's a positive identifier of H phases that was that was included in the processing. Uh, the the, the uh, previous to that, um, the H phase what was whatever uh, remained. The, the first uh, phase to be identified based on these uh, the attribute was the T phase. If uh, if a phase uh, uh, had attributes that uh, Fit all these um, all these conditions. It was called a, a T phase. If if it was uh, fitting these conditions, it's called an N phase, and everything else was basically uh, uh, an H phase. Uh, so there was a is now some positive identification of H phase. <clears throat> all right. So the uh, the other um, going into a bit of detail into the, the hazard. Enhancement um, that included the slowness. And uh, one major uh, thing is that so uh, hydroacoustic stations are meant to detect mostly uh, waves propagating horizontally. Uh, so it's a slowness of uh, roughly um, 70, 75 uh, seconds per degree. Reads as a measure. And uh, Frank Reber introduced the uh, slowness calculation. And um, the, the, the rules in terms of uh, identifying whether it's either a seismic phase, because hydroacoustic stations do detect seismic phase, they, they travel vertically and have detected 
at the uh, at the hydro stations as well. Uh, and so this this slide shows the rule basically that uh, are the decide whether it's a seismic phase or uh, a hydroacoustic phase. And, and if you look at data, um, there is usually, this is a, an example on, on station uh, HO4 North, or the triplet HO4 North, which shows that there's, there's a, a, a natural um, separation between the horizontally traveling waves and, and the ones that travel uh, vertically. There, there's a lot more horizontally detected waves than than vertically detected wave, but that particular day there was there was one of them that's detected. Uh, okay. Um, other examples of, of hazard, and uh, this is uh, to give you a, a flavor of this. And I probably should go a lot faster because I have more slides to to show. So um, th this is showing basically um, the fact that, uh, that there is a very good uh, separation between um, between sequence and, and azimuth for a, this particular data. This is just one explosion uh, in the Gulf of, of Bengal. Um, and this is an, another example that shows uh, how we can use uh, the hydroacoustic T phases to see an evolution of a rupture on the, on the large fault. In this case, is the uh, Indonesian uh, earthquake of 2004, uh, 26 of, of December, 2004. And the uh, variation in azimuth at the station HO8S is very well uh, put into uh, evidence by the hazard. Uh, now, DTK PMCC is uh, something that uh, we are experimenting with uh, Pierre Ignal and, and, and Peter are experimenting with this, and uh, it's it's giving much more um, definition in, in in terms of the azimuth uh, in, in terms of the azimuth uh, estimations, and and we're still they're still working on this in terms of uh, how to best integrate that into the into the system. Um, this is. Um, and, and there is a uh, talk about this uh, at this uh, SNT. This is the fact that uh, hydroacoustic network detected by itself basically detected the DPRK6, and that's probably one of the first time that the uh, DPRK6 was uh, magnitude 6.1 estimated uh, MB magnitude, uh, IDC MB magnitude, and uh, it detected uh, both uh, P phases, uh, which allow us to. Uh, locate the event uh, using just the stations. This is the, the result of this. Um, a new develop, relatively new development uh, in terms of network processing, which includes the uh, hydroacoustic as well, is NetVisa. And there's a lot of material on, on uh, NetVisa at this uh, SNT conference. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, hydroacoustic is is, uh, is processed with together with seismic, and one of the main differences uh, between seismic processing and hydroacoustic processing is, is the uh, is the fact that hydroacoustic is very sensitive to blockage, so waves do not propagate through large islands, and so this is one of the uh, contributions that uh, NetVisa did. Uh, and uh, it, it, it has a, a different modeling of the um, of the uh, blockage. It's using uh, the possibility that there is an out of plane diffraction around an island, and so that allowed uh, to uh, detect uh, to detect uh, sources which would not be detected uh, using the older uh, definition of blockage, which doesn't use uh, diffraction. Okay, to give you an idea of the uh, contribution of hydroacoustic data in, uh, at the IDC, uh, in, uh, in 2020, the REB, the Review and Event Bulletin, uh, contained 34,000 uh, events, and um, events with T phases uh, constitute 25% of that. So uh, that's quite a large uh, percentage of the events. And uh, the uh, events with H phases are much, much less than that. I should have said 
before probably that age phases are uh, coming from explosions. So that those are the in water uh, sources that produce age phases that are much more impulsive and uh, and large large have a large frequency band and also shorter duration. So uh, another major contribution of the uh, of the hydroacoustic network is actually the post analysis uh, screening step. Uh, if if an event is shallow and uh, is uh, located, uh, the epicenter is in an, in an ocean that's deeper than 500 kilometers, uh, it can be safe, safely classified as natural if there are no age phases that, that should be observed. And that's one of the, uh, one of the four uh, screening criteria that are used that way. So um, some work is going on uh, in terms of modeling. The uh, uh, eddies in the oceans, uh, it's uh, known that uh, these eddies have an impact on the acoustic uh, propagation. And so now, just a time warning, we have yeah. uh, five, six minutes left, please. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, I'm going to skip over uh, a number of things, uh, and I think it's probably good to go over um, the uh, the new uh, the new development. So um, this is a very uh, intensive calculation that was done uh, using a parabolic equation, and this is work by uh, Lin and, and Kushida. And uh, what this is showing, I'm going to go uh, very slightly into into a bit of detail here. I mentioned before when I was talking about NetVisa the fact that there is some improvement with NetVisa on the modeling of diffracted arrivals. And this allowed us to detect events which otherwise would not be detected. Uh, so if, if there is diffraction around the island, uh, we, we, will, we will detect uh, the uh, events that uh, are, the, uh, are, are the sources and are, are recorded. Uh, analysts see all the time those events uh, that get diffracted around the islands and the current modeling is not sufficient to, uh, to be able to locate them. So, so that's uh, an effort that's going on uh, to um, to do a better job at um, improving the blockage uh, modeling. Um, 3D modeling, again, this is uh, again 3D modeling. Um, and you have all the uh, references of these works here. So, uh, and, and the, the reference list is, is at the end. So I will uh, leave that with you. Uh, I will go very quickly over uh, the detection. There was a very significant event, detection of uh, an event associated with the uh, disappearance of, uh, of a submarine in, in Argentina. There's a lot of uh, references on that. Uh, and um, what is significant there is that we observed uh, using PMCC this time, uh, very, very large number of reflections, uh, lateral reflections. So I encourage you to read those, uh, those works by uh, Bergos and Dalosco, for instance, that talked about those. And this was modeled using the 3D uh, refraction model. Another, um, another thing that uh, has been going on is the, the modeling of, of T phases. And, uh, and so there's a lot of numerical work that, that's been going on uh, during this, uh, and the references are given, given here. This is work by, by Stevens, uh, recent work, 2020, that's been published. And the idea is to, um, to be able to make better use of the T phase stations, which have a much uh, worse signal to noise ratio than, than the in water uh, hydro, hydrophones. And so, uh, so that work is about this. And we have some ideas on how to basically compute virtual uh, hydrophones. And, uh, that, that work is still ongoing. Okay, so um, now in terms of uh, the uh, enhancements, uh, these are the, uh, the ideas that, uh, that we currently have. Uh, so to initiate exploitation of, of large database of oceanographic and three dimensional uh, ocean signal propagation modeling, that's uh, give you a flavor already. 
uh, provide rigorous physical basis for predicting and interpreting hydroacoustic signal to train and assist in event reading observation and use uh, DTK PMCC to uh, migrate this to uh, functional uh, networks, to operational land, basically, to do that operation. Uh, it's currently on the, on the under development. So in the near future, uh, implementation of three-dimensional ocean signal propagation modeling um, assess the po possibility of using high fidelity seismoacoustic models to predict the conversion of uh, in ocean pressure, rate, pressure waves to in ground propagating seismic waves. This is the work by Stevens that I mentioned in the, in the previous slide. And to better utilize the T phase uh, stations. Um, and uh, this is uh, the, the final report. Uh, and, and there's a geo tragic pure and applied geophysics paper by, by Lidos on this. Um, introduction of machine learning as part of the automatic processing algorithm to identify and characterize recorded in-water pressure waves at hydrophone stations and in-ground seismic waves at these stations. Uh, evaluate the uh, necessary size of training of state-of-art machine learning algorithm to become part of the automatic processing algorithm and eventually supplement with high-fidelity seismoacoustic propagation model introduce seismoacoustic wave propagation physics in, in machine learning algorithm and apply machine learning algorithm to noise reduction at T stations. And, and the long-term vision would be to substitute part or the entire automatic processing chain of hydroacoustic data all the way from detection to event screening with feedback between station processing and network processing. Uh, so this is a longer term. Uh, some some of the near future are quite challenging also, but this is an, an even more challenging uh, project. Okay, and the rest is uh, basically some uh, references. Uh, if you want to go into uh, much more depth uh, to the, the uh, projects and the uh, features that uh, I have uh, mentioned. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, sorry that uh, I had to skip a few few slides. Well, thank you very much, Ronan, uh, for this uh, comprehensive presentation. Um, we'll take questions at the end for both uh, speakers. So to stay on time, um, let us move to the next uh, presenter, who is the distinguished professor of geophysics from the Scripps Institution of uh, Oceanography, Professor John Orkut. I will try to summarize his extraordinary CV. His background is in mathematics, physics, physical chemistry, and he received his PhD in earth sciences from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He also served on Navy fleet ballistic submarines and resigned his commission as commander in 1977. He has been named fellow of the American Geophysical Union in 1988, and he became president of this union from 2004 to 2006. Within the AGU, he created a new open access journal titled Earth and Space Science with the goal of providing a peer review venue for publishing instrument software design, testing, and modeling. He received a number of awards in, during his career, including the Ewing Medal from the USN and the AGU. He has been named uh, UCSD University of California, San Diego, Outstanding um, Alumnus of the Year and Top 100 Influential Alumni. Uh, he has been listed who is who in America since 2001 and he is an honorary fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society since 2005. He was the principal investigator for the um, NSF Ocean Observatories Initiative, and he was elected to the American Philosophical Society in 2002 and the National Academy of Engineering in 2011. He chaired a number of research uh, committees and panels including one that provided review on hydroacoustic monitoring of uh, the CTBT. 
Professor John Orkut has more than 175 scientific papers and book chapters. And it is my honor and privilege to invite him to present his ideas on improving ocean monitoring through the expansion of the global seismographic network on the seafloor. Professor Orkut, the stage is yours. Please, can you play back the uh, video? It's a great pleasure to have been invited to participate in the 25th anniversary of the CTBTO, the organization that has pioneered in inventing or borrowing useful technologies needed for operating an office dedicated to monitoring clandestine nuclear tests. Seismology has been key in detecting potential tests, but acoustic instruments in the global ocean are increasingly important. The ocean stations coupled to land by seafloor cables has been well maintained and the quality has improved. The high standard of the work has drawn new scientists to the headquarters in Vienna. The ocean instrumentation connections between academia, CTBTO, and diplomacy has benefited all. Scientific interest at CDBTO in ocean thermometry, for example, has promoted basic science in a changing ocean and enhanced communications with academia. This is a graphical depiction of the measurement capabilities of the Global Seismic Network, or GSN, which is in place today. The Ocean GSN meets all technical requirements, including dynamic range, broadband response, quiet instruments, and real-time telemetry. While current seafloor seismic observatories are temporary and are not distributed evenly, we are seeking funding to deploy at least one system for five years. Ultimately, we seek to add 35 new stations to match the instrumentation currently deployed on continents and generally noisy islands. Please note that the x-axis is in period rather than frequency, one being the inverse of the other. The nanometric seismometers meet the requirements for frequency bandwidth and amplitude specifications. In the case of the oceans, tides are recorded on the differential pressure gauge in the seismometer, although earth tides are much smaller than the ocean tides. Prior to 2020, IRS, or the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, which was founded in 1984, funded a committee of scientists to explore the possibility for measurements in the oceans. Dr. Monica Kohler at Caltech chaired the committee and a report was published in 2020. The committee made several recommendations, including deployments for four years or more, high bandwidth, the multiplicity of OBSs for redundancy and noise reduction, and possible seismometer burial. They proposed that the experiment be conducted in the central North Atlantic or central southern Pacific Ocean. The scientific rationale for these OBS observations were substantial, including whole earth tomography, studies of the inner core, lower mantle structure, slow slip event source physics, explosions, tsunamis, surface wave dispersion, shear wave splitting, and receiver functions. Real-time applications were important. The report was extensive and has served to define the field of seafloor seismology for at least a decade. This is the Global Seismographic Network, or GSN, station coverage as represented through geographic density of stations. A is Africa-centered and B is Pacific-centered. Color contours show the number of GSN stations within 10 degrees of each point on the maps. Andy Frasetto provided the maps.
This map of stations is identical to those in the last figure, with the exception that a single projection shows the global distribution of station densities. SCP connotes a shear, or S-wave, from an earthquake at the source to the core metal boundary. The return path is a P-wave. The expected SCP seismic phase arrival detection rates are provided as a function of geographic location. The location where more SCP arrivals could be detected are shown in pink, and fewer SCP signals detected are shown in blue. The three color scales correspond to three different OBS deployment durations, with color indicating how many phases we would expect to record at each possible station location on the seafloor. A is Africa Center, B is Pacific Center. Stars are earthquakes within specified time durations with magnitudes greater than 6.5, and triangles are GSN station locations. Earth's normal modes have been observed on the seafloor several times to date. The excitation generally requires large events, in this case a large earthquake in 2005 in the Sumatra Andaman area. The bandwidth extends from 0.2 MHz to 2.3 MHz. The stations on the right are OBSs deployed for studies of the OI hotspot plume. The plots to the left are results from other Ocean Island stations. Neither Midway nor Poha's Teledyne 54,000 recorded modes. Two seismometers at Kupapa did record normal modes as well as Poha's STS-2. The OBSs did record normal modes, although the coherence was poor below 1.23 MHz. New seismometers have significantly increased the bandwidth for normal mode research. This is an acceleration power spectrum plot taken during a quiet day in the Pacific northeast of Hawaii. The blue trace is a broadband ocean bottom seismograph, or OBS, which shows typical variation of noise levels associated with double frequency microseisms generated by opposing ocean waves. Around a hundredth of a hertz, there is a smooth increase in noise levels associated with the passage of long waves at the ocean surface. These low frequency waves flex the underlying lithosphere. At 8 Hz and above, OBS high frequencies are markedly lower than the comparable measure from Kupapa, Oahu, and approaches the lowest noise levels on continents, the dash black line. Kupapa typically has very low noise levels compared to other islands around the planet. These are power spectra of very low frequency waves from the 15 November 2006 Kurile Islands earthquake. The very low frequency normal modes of Earth are clear in both OBS plots. However, the spectra on the right are clear and extend to lower frequencies. The data collected on the right used a nanometric seismometer with 120 second natural frequency. Nanometrics has developed a new Trillium Horizon 360, which is suited for ocean deployments. As on land, seafloor signal levels are comparable to those recorded on continents. We have developed a seafloor burial system which can autonomously bury a seismometer to a depth of a meter. The external batteries provide the power for the pumps, which evacuate the caissons at the apex of each corner. The system is deployed from a ship and lands on the soft sediments. The flotation allows the recovery of the burial system for further deployments.
This movie shows how the assembly is pumped into the sediments at the seafloor. The process is reversed at the end to recover the assembly. In this movie, Woods Hole's Jason was used to provide the suction for burying the seismometer and reversing the process for recovery. This movie shows how the assembly is pumped into the sediments at the seafloor. The process is reversed at the end to recover the assembly. In this movie, Woods Hole's Jason was used to provide the suction for burying the seismometer and reversing the process for recovery. Please click on the image and then on the arrow to start the movie. This figure illustrates how a seismometer can be buried for a long-term deployment. The system arrives on the seafloor at the left and is buried by using the pumps and batteries. When the burial is complete, the pumps are reversed to return the mechanism to the seafloor. The burial system returns to the surface, leaving packages on the seafloor for power, electronics, and communications to the surface. This figure illustrates how a seismometer can be buried for a long-term deployment. The system arrives on the seafloor at the left and is buried by using the pumps and batteries. When the burial is complete, the pumps are reversed to return the mechanism to the seafloor. The burial system returns to the surface, leaving packages on the seafloor for power, electronics, and communications to the surface. This is a conceptual design of an autonomous ship which would be capable of launching and recovering ocean bottom seismographs or OBSs and related instrumentation. The design includes a gantry crane for picking up packages astern for launch and recovering seafloor systems. The green octagon is a phase antenna for low earth orbit satellite communications and the basket near the bow is used for re recovery through the moon pool. Because there are no people aboard the ship, facilities such as staterooms, galleys, and wastewater management are not necessary. It is practical to power the ship with hydrogen, which could greatly decrease the emissions associated with manned systems. The autonomy will greatly decrease the costs of the long-term seafloor global seismic and acoustic operations. I remember well the magazine Byte, which was popular in the 70s and 80s. This edition was all about UCS. SD's Pascal language, which could be used on early desktop computers. I use this, however, to show that seemingly infinite moor buoys would be needed to measure ocean temperatures in C2. When Walter Monk gave his first lecture at Scripps uh, to describe the new science of thermometry, which he pioneered, his point was that the complexity of oceanography dictated very dense arrangements of buoys to understand the variations in temperature in the ocean due to the greenhouse effect. Walter's solution, of course, involved acoustic sources and vertical line arrays of distant hydrophones to average over the great distances. This approach has been used in seismology for decades to determine lateral heterogeneity in Earth's interior. Since Walter and Peter Wooster were surrounded with seismologists, they, with Carl Wunsch at MIT, initiated ocean thermometry. This plot shows time advancing along the y-axis and the detailed behavior of received acoustic variations along the x-axis. Received power is plotted along the z-axis. These are essentially the data that seismologists plot from a received signal from an explosion or earthquake.
a seismologist understands intuitively how to solve the problem by determining the structure along the paths that waves or rays travel through the earth. In order to keep the sound levels low in the ocean, Walter used a long, low-power coded signal to keep the levels very low. When the data were collected, they were correlated with the output signal to produce this figure. The rays along which sound propagates in the ocean are depicted in this figure. In acoustics, rays and modes are directly coupled with large amplitudes at turning points. On the ray plot above, the largest arrivals occur late in the plot. The ocean temperature has a minimum at approximately a thousand meters depth. Physics dictates that this is the largest arrival which provides an excellent estimate for the sound speed at that depth. All the other rays arrive earlier and are much smaller. Geophysical inverse theory provides the recipes for extracting the temperature at depth and along the path from source to receiver. This averaging of the structure allows accuracies accurate estimates of warming over years and decades. A global array of sources and receivers will follow the measurement of global ocean temperature at least once a day. Every day, meteorologists could report on the global temperature variations. Of course, this warming happens slowly, so the daily report won't attract many viewers. One other attribute of the continuous estimates of ocean temperature allows received signals to estimate the position of a point in the ocean quite accurately, that is, acoustic GPS. As more and more data are collected and daily estimates are made along the ray paths, the system becomes increasingly accurate. The horizontal position of a receiver at various depths are shown on the left, and the estimated position errors are on the right. The peak would be a rough estimate of horizontal position. In this case, the expected error is about 45 meters. Multiple stations around the globe would greatly reduce this uncertainty. The positions of autonomous and manned vehicles in the ocean could be located quite accurately. Wen Bo Yu and others reported an innovative approach to thermometry. The paper in Science in 2020 reported on the use of repeating earthquakes in an ocean path from Sumatra to Diego Garcia or Station Degar in the Indian Ocean to determine ocean temperature changes. This is an interesting use of natural sources traveling to an Ida station. They inferred a dec decadal warming trend that substantially exceeds previous estimates. Broadband stations elsewhere in the Indian Ocean, including new ocean seafloor systems, could be used to track temperature changes and warming. Repeating earthquakes and other sites in the world ocean could be used to monitor changing ocean temperatures. This is a photo of my mechanical engineer writing the propulsion part of a wave glider invented and constructed by Liquid Robotics, now owned by Boeing. The sled at the surface is propelled by the vanes below where the engineer stands and connects to the sled, which navigates the system from GPS and connects with users using a LEO spacecraft, Iridium. We have used this system to move data from an OBS on the seafloor to an acoustic receiver towed by the wave glider and thence to the lab.
While acoustics can readily transmit data from the seafloor at low sample rates, moving large amounts of full bandwidth data to shore is problematic. Woods Hole has developed a blue-green light optical system for data transfer. The Remus Autonomous Underwater Vehicle, or AUV, carries an optical source that is compatible with a similar system on an OBS. The specs for this system are remarkably superior to the current acoustics approach in terms of bandwidth. The system has been tested and promises a means for high-speed telemetry. There are several approaches in which the blue-green data transfer could be used. In this case, the AUV simply approaches the OBS and does a data transfer. The AUV would return to the surface and download the data through Iridium. The only downside is that the AUV itself is restricted to depths no greater than 600 meters. <clears throat> In this case, a wave glider could download data directly from the OBS using a source on the wave glider keel. The depth of water would again have an impact on the feasibility of data transfer. In this case, an oceanographic ship can lower a communication system on a winch to the sea floor. The system could readily move large amounts of data to the ship and thence to shore. An alternative to the previous scenario would use a liquid robotics winch to lower an optical modem to the OBS on the sea floor. While the company has been working on winches for other programs, additional development would be necessary. The Navy autonomous ship Sea Hunter at Navy base in San Diego. Peter Michaleski is to the left. The ship has traveled to Pearl Harbor and back autonomously. The Seahawk is a newer autonomous ship and is also in San Diego. Peter Michaleski is largely responsible for the construction of Sea Hunter and is working with us on this project. We are collaborating with a startup named SeaTrek. Dr. Yi Chow worked at JPL for many years and formed a new company to generate power at sea associated with a significant temperature change from sea floor to the surface. The method depends upon a phase change from solid to liquid and a special material that results in a significant volume change. The phase change from solid to liquid occurs by cycling the system several times a day. As the warming liquid flows to a reservoir, a generator produces electrical power which can be used to operate seafloor systems such as an OBS. The potential SeaTrek system is shown in this figure. The SeaTrek vehicle cycles from the surface to depths of a thousand meters and more. The power is used to fuel the OBS while also collecting data. When the system reaches the surface, it can also transmit data to a LEO spacecraft. Over the past two decades, there has been a revolution in electronics. A few examples are shown in this table. Presently, the newest OBSs were designed and built 14 years ago. Some of the active source OBSs were built more than 30 years ago and would fit far to the left in the table. Consumers today replace their cell phones every two to three years to keep up with the technology. 
The accelerating rate of change also impacts the electronic connector industry. Connector manufacturers must constantly upgrade the performance of their interconnects in order to satisfy challenging applicant demands for higher speed, reduced size, and global availability. We are all familiar with the drawers full of old cables that no longer fit any of the equipment that we have in hand. During the past year, with support from O&R, we completed a redesign of a single instrument. We worked closely with Nanometrics in combining the OBS electronics with the Nanometrics Pegasus beta logger. Overall, power requirements decreased by a factor of two, which allows a deployment of more than two years. The broadband OBSs are in the lab two-thirds of the time today. The redesign reduces this to a sixth. We propose to examine even greater power savings. Starlink, operated by SpaceX, currently has 1,635 LEO satellites on orbit. They plan to increase this to 2,814 satellites when the system is fully operational. IGPP is currently testing a Starlink system at the Cecil and Ida Green Pinion Flight Observatory for GSN telemetry as well as possible applications to the Ocean GSN. Iridium is a well-tested system that has been used for seafloor data delivery via a liquid robotics wave glider. OneWeb emerged from bankruptcy this last month with funding from the UK government. They plan to operate a viable commercial LEO system in the near future. Tsunami warning is an important capability in the world ocean. This figure shows a prediction of tsunami height by the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center for the Kermadec Island earthquake this year. The tsunami heights range from zero to one meter around the Pacific. The buoys used for early warning are susceptible to cable wear and breakage, and at any time the system may have failures of 33% or more. Detecting tsunamis with C4 seismographs and differential pressure gauges is straightforward. The plot is a spectrogram for an OBS at a depth of 2,936 meters off the coast of Oregon. The tsunami was excited by an earthquake on the Queen Charlotte Islands. The arrival of the earthquake occurred at about 0305, and the record of the event is shown in the top wave train. The event is followed by large numbers of small aftershocks with a major aftershock at 1900. The arrow at the bottom left points to the tsunami record itself. Formally, this is a chirp that starts at low frequencies and ends at high frequencies. The differential pressure gauge generally has a more prominent record than an absolute pressure gauge. A distributed network of OBSs with telemetry would contribute greatly to tsunami warning. This is a similar view of a tsunami and power spectra from CTBTO Hydroacoustic Station HA3, published in GRL on the 23rd of November 2016. The authors were Matsumoto, Harabalis, Zampoli, and Ozil. The stations comprise two separate installations with three hydrophones at each station, and each station is cabled to the land. The station is located in the Juan Fernandez Islands or Robinson Crusoe Islands. The ends of W8.3 earthquake occurred on 16 September 2015 at a range of 700 kilometers. The station was located southwest of the epicenter in Chile. The paper describes the processing necessary to recover signals at very low frequencies. In the previous slide, differential pressure gauges were used, which are flat to pressure to very low frequencies. A broad global distribution of hydrophones and pressure gauges are a valuable contribution to estimating seismic hazards and especially tsunamis. 
given that both deliver data in near real time. An ocean broadband observatory is depicted in this drawing. The ship, which is communicating with a LEO satellite, has finished with launching a variety of instruments and is heading home. An autonomous ship is also communicating with a satellite and is nearby a sea track system connected to an OBS on the sea floor. It is also communicating with the satellite. On the left hand side, a wave glider is uploading data from an OBS acoustically and the wave glider is passing along data to the LEO system. There are two acoustic vertical line arrays with yellow colored sources and red colored floats sending out coded wave trains for thermometry measurements and acoustic GPS for distant systems. There is an autonomous underwater vehicle in the foreground collecting data from an OBS using blue-green light. The NSF Convergence Accelerator Program addresses national scale societal challenges through user-inspired convergence research. Using a convergence approach and innovation processes like human-centered design, user discovery and team science, and the integration of multidisciplinary research, the Convergence Accelerator seeks to transition basic research and discovery into practice to solve high-impact societal challenges aligned with specific research themes. The team outlined has proposed to construct a global geophysical observatory as described in this talk. If the proposal is accepted, we will spend nine months in integrating the team and solving known engineering problems with coaches from the NSF program. If we can converge over this time period, we will be asked to submit a second proposal for two years and $5 million in funding to implement a global geophysical station. The team comprises three universities, four companies, and a not-for-profit. It's an organizational challenge, but the payoffs are important for global seismology, acoustics, climate, autonomy, sound in the ocean, nuclear test detection, and ocean engineering. This is a photo of the recovery of a broadband OBS in the Atlantic in 2017. The pros to the right describe a young scientist delight uh, discovering the high quality of data collected along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge during a year's deployment. The photo appeared in AGU's EOS newsletter recently and shows one of these instruments coming back aboard the ship. Matthew Ages at the Roma Trey University in Rome is the lead author of a recent paper describing the results which were published in Nature on 22 January 2021. The title was A Thin Mantle Transition Zone Beneath the Equatorial Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The data were originally collected by scientists Catherine Reichert and Nicholas Harmon at the University of Southampton and Michael Kendall at the University of Oxford starting in 2016. The experiment used broadband instruments from Scripps. At the time, Aegis was a postdoc at Southampton. The data revealed images of the Mantle Transition Zone, or MTZ, which is the boundary between the upper and lower mantle at 410 to 660 kilometers. Beneath the mid-ocean ridge, the transition zone appeared to be pinched. The shear wave velocities in the transition zone were also slower than typical of old Atlantic seafloor. The structure appeared to indicate upwelling of the lower mantle to the upper mantle. Seafloor spreading is often attributed to a cooling lithosphere sinking into the mantle at trenches. This was the first time that scientists have been able to collect broadband data from the ocean ridge, indicating the great importance of collecting such data in the oceans. The data again provide evidence that the upward circulating mantle causes the lithosphere to be pushed from the mid-ocean ridge rather than dragged by a cooling sinking lithosphere. Time and more experiments 
will tell. Thank you very much. Uh, both presentations were very, very interesting and uh, like to thank again both speakers. Um, we have some time for a few questions um, and let me start with one question that was posted from our viewers for um, Runan. Um, the question is uh, if you can give us any indications on the timeline to in implement the 3D model in OPS or test bed? Okay, so I think I think it depends which 3D model. Um, but if, uh, if we proceed as we have now by storing tables for, for blockage, for instance, uh, this can be done quite, quite quickly. Um, so it's a matter of generating appropriate uh, the appropriate tables for for each station and upgrade what we we currently have uh, in operation. So that that part would be uh, pretty quick. Uh, just that the uh, the model would be uh, much more precise, the blockage model much more precise, and and perhaps we can envision uh, envision uh, adding the depths uh, opponent. But I I would. I would ask maybe uh, Peter if he has any question. Yes, so. well, I don't know. If... Okay, so um, that's that's my understanding of this. Now, having having uh, on the fly computation of three D, of course, that's not uh, that's not and, and that's not possible. Very short term. Okay, I, I may add a little bit. I mean, I agree completely with uh, Ronan that if, if we want to update the, the tables in, in the automatic processing pipeline as they are now, then um, it is feasible to include 3D modeling results. It will require time to run on so, and it is, uh, if, for, if, for example, you want to rely on probability weighted arrival time, then the models have to be run at multiple frequencies, and that take may take a long time. Yeah. In addition to that, then I mean there are bigger visions with including 3D underwater acoustic modeling uh, results into the automatic pipeline, and um, and the efforts done so far here have has included a roadmap that says that um, that that predicts that uh, in 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 four years' time or so, we should be able to uh, exploit 3D features in the model result and try to demonstrate that it has an impact in the automatic question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, there are two aspects there I would like to add. Uh, one is the travel time, the other one is the blockage map. Because even just updating the blockage map, it is going to probably help a lot in terms of association. Uh, if we move away from a purely 2D blockage map to something where we can get the transition around the, from diffraction around islands and other bathymetric features. So th those are like two topics that are a little bit independent from each other because they will probably require two different modeling approaches also. Right. Right. Thank you very much. Um, one question for John. Um, the very interesting high-tech data transfer and both the, the transfer of energy, the Citrek, uh, this technology uh, is, is dependent on environmental conditions. So I would like to ask John, um, can, you, can you give us an indication of, of like sea state or what kind of weather conditions would allow uh, these these uh, these systems to to work as designed. Well, we've actually tested that uh, fairly thoroughly, particularly with the acoustic approach. Uh, you saw the wave glider that we had used. We did deploy the um, the system uh, between Hawaii and and uh, La Jolla uh, a couple of years ago. 
uh, with acoustics to the seafloor and uh, uh, iridium, um, the low Earth orbit system at the top. And uh, we are able with the acoustic system to uh, deliver uh, data at one hertz from all four channels, uh, inertial channels and the uh, differential pressure gauge. Uh, the data were always, uh, we, we have no missing data during that uh, three to four month deployment. Uh, the system worked uh, quite nicely uh, during that period of time and the weather did change uh, from time to time. We did uh, once get blown off station, as it were, the, the glider couldn't keep up, but we were able to recover um, uh, data um, when we got back to the site with the wave glider, when it got itself back there, it, it's, uh, it does this uh, autonomously. We are able to do that, and uh, we can also um, disrupt the 1 hertz uh, data to collect the full 50 hertz data set uh, over a period of time when there's an interesting earthquake. Um, so that the system actually worked quite well, but it has some flaws with the uh, um, um, weather. But the newest version, which we have a um, two of these, the has a, actually has a propeller uh, that can be activated uh, when the seas get relatively high and uh, can push the thing uh, to stay near um, the system on the seafloor. So acoustically and uh, through the satellite system, the, the, um, uh, the delay, the latency was about two minutes from the time the data were collected on the seafloor before the time it uh, arrived at uh, our workstations at uh, IGBP at Scripps. So we're, we're pretty, uh, pretty confident that, that uh, there are a variety of techniques <clears throat> and the, uh, the systems are improving to a substantial degree. Um, one of the reasons for having an autonomous vehicle available, of course, is to be, is to replace some of these things as they where out through the year they need to be hauled back aboard and a uh, new system done. But we believe we can do that with a ship. And uh, fortunately, the cost of an autonomous ship is quite low, as I hinted at anyway in the talk. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. Um, I'm informed that our session has an impressive number of, of viewers. So um, thank you for the very interesting presentation. And I encourage the viewers to pose questions uh, uh, through a super event and uh, uh, our speakers can, can address them. Uh, with that, uh, I think uh, Mario has a question. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I actually had a, thank you, a few questions for John. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. But uh, before starting with the first question, I would like to uh, advertise also for, for you, John, if you're interested tomorrow, there will be the ocean session that is chaired by John and Peter, uh, talk by Wen Bo Wu, where he uses actually also the Diego Garcia hydrophones to do the thermometry and show the thermometry that might, that's an interesting new development on the paper that you cited, which was using the Diego Garcia seismic station. And along those lines, I would like to ask you, with all the fascinating things that you showed, uh, these uh, amazing uh, ocean bottom seismometer networks that will be available in the future, where would you see the biggest opportunities for synergy, for cooperation between that OBS future system and uh, the IMS hydroacoustic hydrophone station network? Well, one of the um, uh, standards that we do adhere to is uh, the data that we do collect uh, from these seafloor stations um, uh, come to our institute, but they also then go directly to IRIS and the data management system they have. And so they uh, in, in the future, uh, when we have these things operating more permanently, um, the, the, hydro, the differential pressure gauge data, as well as the inertial data will be available through that uh, 
through that site and the latency should be quite low. It should be a matter of minutes or uh, in the uh, probably minutes uh, from the time the thing happens. Uh, it comes through our lab and then uh, immediately goes into the uh, data system. So I think that, and and of course, if the CTBTO wanted to feed uh, off these uh, systems, there'd be no, there's no policy that we have that would prevent us from opening up a, a pipe to, uh, to Vienna to deliver the data and do with it what you would. So it is, go it is going to be an open system. It's not going to be closed. So, um, I'm, uh, I think that's an important thing to do for particularly in science. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. And uh, two follow up questions on Yorgo's questions. Uh, on the AUVs that would go down and download data or do the servicing, um, you mentioned a 600 meter limit. Uh, but is that really just a limit on the AUV platform, right? You, you, if you had AUVs like that, there are deep diving AUVs that, that do side scan sort of nowadays and things like that, but not much more. But if you could foresee that those technologies that reach two, three thousand meters could be uh, adapted so that you could go deeper with the OBSs. Yes, of course, uh, Woods Hole. The, the system that Woods Hole used for this test that they did was a, a system that was restricted to um, a few hundred meters. But there are, as you point out, AUVs that can operate more um, more deeply. And uh, we have a lot of testing to do, I think, with the blue green laser. How how large a standoff can we uh, manage um, in, uh, in in deep water? Uh, for collecting data with the blue green, so I don't don't necessarily have an answer at this point in time. Uh, we've demonstrated it with a, a straightforward system uh, working out of Woods Hole. Uh, the the AUV left Woods Hole autonomously, went out to the site where the OBS was, and uh, uh, collected the data and then swam back. And that worked quite well. But that is the test that we've done. With this system, and I hope with the uh, uh, this new program at the National Science Foundation, they will actually begin to uh, um, support some of the, the engineering necessary to make all of this work. And uh, time will tell. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I think one for Ronan. Uh, yes, I, I, I do have one more question for Ronan on the processing. Um, yes, and, and that concerns uh, the phase identification. And that's something that uh, I, I, I wonder about sometimes. For the hydro phases, would it be an idea to think about revisiting the phase identification algorithm? I'm thinking, for example, of cases like when we had the P phase arrivals from the DPRK six nuclear tests, which were not uh, associated uh, for stations that were at a large angular distance to to the source, but had a very good signal to noise ratio. Uh, that, that's one example, probably. But yeah, uh, some, sometimes I have the feeling that we are pushed. Uh, to identifying phases manually uh, when maybe there would be nowadays more knowledge and to, to be able to do this automatically. Okay, so yeah, so the question is about phase identification and whether we could do better. Yes, of course, we, we could do better. Um, and uh, we're still rule-based there uh, for hydroacoustic. Uh, so, uh, definitely, this, this is an area that's ripe for methods such as uh, machine learning. I think that that would be uh, the difficulty with machine learning for this type of thing is that, and we experienced that with, uh, with seismic before, is that you need a very good uh, uh, ground truth data. And so, so, it would take some upfront work to, to have sufficient data that you can trust to actually train your network or whatever machine learning methods you, you want to use. So 
Um, yes, and, and there has been some some attempts at doing that, uh, uh, and um, and and they have been published. Uh, one of the references in the talk actually is, is about this by by Tuma, I believe. So um, so it just hasn't gone to the point of of application, but uh, it, it did show some promising results. So um, and. Uh, there are all kinds of signals, uh, hydroacoustic data that, um, in my mind, should be possible to to label. You know, I mean, we should be able to label. Well, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a seismic uh, survey. This is a whale. This is a T phase. Yeah. This is a, an explosion, and so on. And so I think it's a it's a wide open field for people who would be interested in in researching that. Thanks, Juan. Peter would like to add something. Yeah, I, I think I think I, the machine learning and artificial intelligence is very attractive to include, and and uh, you know it it is it has arrived to stay. But I still think also that the automatic processing pipeline can benefit for revisiting the rule base because we know already now that that for example, if we take the uh, underwater acoustic anom anomaly that was detected uh, in, in in relation to surf the surface of, of the Argentinian submarine, that we received uh, signals on HA10 and HA04 from the same source, but the signals had totally different characteristics, and they were they were classified differently, and. Uh, I think if, 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 for example, we have highly high fidelity models that can tell us why, why do the signals look so different, then we can take rules out of that and put them into the automatic processing pipeline. So we get the same, yeah. same uh, classification of the arrival. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, fundamentally, it's a classification model. So the machine learnings come to mind, but um, yeah, anything that, uh, that can help uh, understanding, and then the work you've done on that is 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 amazing, actually, because you showed basically why they are different. Work on uh, navigation at high latitude. So, um, so so yes, we could um, based on a specific path um, have different rules. Uh, it's 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 quite possible. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ronan. Uh, one question for John. Um, could you please elaborate a little bit on the uh, the time scale of the the expansion of of the GSN uh, on on the seafloor? Well, I think the opportunities are are there. Um, as I said, we've uh, we've asked the National Science Foundation. Uh, for funding uh, to build the first of these. Um, we have no idea whether that will, will, will succeed with the NSF, but um, uh, uh, if, it, if it works, it'll get us on, uh, on the way. One of the other things that's happened in the, um, uh, the, U the U.S. this year is that the um, Congress has essentially doubled the uh, National Science Foundation's budget and set up a new directorate in engineering um, when and when that happens this fall. And this this could potentially make an enormous change to uh, the way that we do science, we do physics um, in the US. And it would provide, I think, a real opportunity for us to uh, to begin this process of building out the stations um, much more quickly than otherwise would happen. So many instruments that we use have been developed over the years by the Office of Naval Research and Department of Defense, and and uh, we relied on them greatly for um, new instrumentation and and the engineering part of this. But times are changing, so I think uh, this may be a good opportunity technologically. I think it's solid, and um, I look forward to uh, participating in this in the next few years. Thank you. And I very much enjoyed. And thanks for all the, the help and uh, you gave me during the uh, preparation for this and and so on. Um, so 
that's best of luck and great meeting. Thank you very much for everything. Uh, John, Roman, uh, it has been uh, a pleasure and honor having you uh, here and uh, until the next time, uh, thank you very much to, to both of you and to our viewers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been thank a you. pleasure too. Thank you. Bye-bye.